Welcome to our continuing inquiry into the development of Christian theology. Uh, we are continuing our lesson in what we call soteriology, or our teaching, the church's teachings about salvation. And one of the big questions at the heart of soteriology is the question, how exactly does the suffering and death and resurrection of Jesus accomplish our salvation? This is not clear. And so over the centuries, inquiring Christian theologians came up with some theories. Now, all of these theories that you're going to hear about, we'll tell you about a few of them, are really to be understood as analogies. We're using the language of analogy to try to express a deeper reality that really ultimately is beyond human language. And so now, uh, Dr. Esther Diane Smith is uh, going to be uh, uh, giving us a description of some of these major theories that have been put forth throughout the centuries in the continuing theological conversation of the church. Thank you, Bishop Peter. My pleasure. <laughs> um, <laughs> last week, we went over three of them the ransom theory, the recapitulation theory, and the satisfaction theory. And I've got three more for us to go over tonight. Um, the first one is called the penal substitution theory. This view was formulated by the 16th century Protestant reformers as an extension of Anselm's satisfaction theory. Anselm's theory was correct in introducing the satisfaction aspect of Christ's work and its necessity. However, the Protestant reformers saw it as insufficient because it was reference to God's honor rather than his justice and holiness and was couched more in terms of a commercial transaction than a penal substitution. This reformed view says simply, that Christ died for humanity in humanity's place, taking the sins of humanity upon himself and bearing them for humanity. The bearing of humanity's sins takes the punishment for them and sets the believer free from the penal stamp demands of the law, the righteousness of the law and the holiness of God are satisfied by this substitution. I remember growing up as an evangelical Christian and salvation was explained in those terms. I broke the law. I was in a court of law, my judge being God, and um, I was found guilty. And the, I had to pay a fine, but I was unable to pay the fine. So Jesus comes along and he pays the fine for me and I'm set free. I get a get out of jail for free card, but Jesus paid the fine. And so this was a, an analogy of salvation that is very legalistic. Like I receive a penalty for my sin, but Jesus pays the penalty for me. Is that what this is about? Yeah, that's this, what it's about. It's a legal transaction. Hmm. which is a reduction of salvation. Well, and it sounds like a Roman kind of point of right. view from their government. Right. It's, it's, least, it's, it's a very legalistic, legal. it, it does show, a, a betray Roman civil mm -hmm. jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the next one is called the moral example theory or the moral influence theory. Christ died to influence humankind toward moral improvement. Mm -hmm. This theory denies that Christ died to satisfy any principle of divine justice, but teaches instead that his death was designed to greatly impress humankind with a sense of God's love, resulting in softening their hearts and leading them to repentance. Thus, the atonement is not directed towards God with the purpose of maintaining divine justice, but towards humanity with the purpose of persuading them to right action. Formulated by Peter Abelard from 1079 to 1142, partially in reaction against uh, Anselm's satisfaction theory. This view was held in the 16th century. Um, Versions of it can be found later in F.D.E. Schleiermacher. 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 Yeah, who lived from 1768 to 1834, and Horace Bushnell, who lived from 1802 to 1876. Um, romanticism, they coincided with mm -hmm. the romantic period. It, it, um, Schleiermacher is seen as the father of the liberal theological movement. Okay, for, that, for this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the third one is the governmental theory. God made Christ an example of suffering to exhibit to erring man that sin is displeasing to him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> God's moral government of the world made it necessary for him to evince his wrath against sin in Christ. Mm. Christ died as a token of God's displeasure towards sin, mm. and it was accepted by God as sufficient. But actually, God does not exact strict justice. Uh, this view was formulated by Hugo Grotius lived from 1583 to 1645 and subsequently found in Arminianism, Charles Finney, the New England theology of Jonathan Edwards, and Methodism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with these? What are we to believe? Well, the conclusion would be we just don't know how it works. That these are theories that people come up with, but the theories themselves often fall far short of the reality we're experiencing. Okay. So these are analogous ways of trying to explain how it works, the mechanism of our salvation. But ultimately, we don't know. It's a mystery that's beyond explanation. Is there one in particular that Roman Catholics um, seem to adopt? The Anselmian one, mm -hmm. the classical, what is it called? Satisfaction theory. Um, yeah, the, the third th one. The third one down is characteristic of medieval Roman Catholicism, mm -hmm. which remember all of our ancestors were Roman Catholic mm -hmm. at this time. So we're talking about our ancestors. But rather a debt paid to God on behalf of sinners. Right. Pay paying the price. Mm -hmm. The earliest theory is the ransom theory. Mm -hmm. Which is that the debt is paid to the devil to free us. Mm -hmm. um, and the satisfaction theory is just the opposite of that. Yeah. The debt, the debt is paid to God. Right. <clears throat> the ransom is paid off to the devil. It's the idea that human evil has been caused by the fact that humanity has is being held hostage mm -hmm. by evil angelic forces who are really wow. the source of evil. Wow. And that, and I'm speaking by way of analogy. So it's like um, the devil is holding us hostage 
So and the dilemma for Jesus is how or God is how do you rescue the hostage without entering the hostage? So these things always come from pre you know, predecessors. Right. So where did that come from? The ransom theory? Yeah. Where do you think that evolved out of? Uh, I th it, that's the earliest theory. Um, I think it could evolve out of some of the statements that Jesus made. Mm -hmm. The Son of Man has come to give his life as a ransom okay. for many. You know, that sounds like the mess. And hostage taking and paying ransom was common in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. Still practiced in the Middle East by certain uh, Arab cultures. Okay. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, so now we're going to continue with our outline, the worksheet, Salvation Part 2, Concepts and Images. You can keep that. I've got one. Oh, you do? Uh -huh. So give your outline. Your worksheet. And we've got the words to fill it in. We're going to give you the words how to fill it in. <laughs> Number one, the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. That comes from Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17a. So the word in that first blank is righteousness. Capital A. The righteousness of God is God's saving action. Is the, are the terms that go in there. Saving action in Christ Jesus on behalf of humanity. This is an important point because... Um, Many later Christian theologians would interpret this very legalistically and would think of the expression, the righteousness of God, was referring to the moral purity of God, thus equating moral purity with the divine life. And this is a kind of exaltation of moral purity. But the reality is that is not how Paul is using the word. When he uses the righteousness of God, he's referring to God's dynamic activity of putting things right by sa saving humanity from its own self-destructive self. So um, when we think of the righteousness of God, Think of God as saving humanity. That's his righteousness. Not this abstract moral purity that's in the mind of God. Was that helpful? Yeah. Um, the word righteousness can be read as uh, in, in right relationship with. Mm. And the saving action of Christ is to get humanity back into right relationship with God. The emphasis being relational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Relationship, yeah. B, the saving action of Christ includes his suffering and death for our sins and his resurrection for our justification is the word that we need. Yeah, not blank. It's justification. That's an important term in the uh, writings of Paul. Or salvation. Which, which is, is synonymous in his uh, writings with salvation. Which is a new life. And that's from Romans 4, for, uh, chapter 4, verse 25. And then uh, Roman numeral 2, we've got a whole list of terms that need to be defined. So the definition of terms Capital A, salvation is the word we're looking at. The word at. salvation, A. The liberation of the entire human person, the entire human race, and the whole of creation from the power of death and corruption of moral evil or sin and suffering. Um, okay. B. B. 
justification is the term to be brought into right relationship to God, to be made righteous. This term is relational. It defines our understanding. Let's try again. It defines our standing in relation to God. It is more than mere moral goodness. It is to be in an appropriate social relationship with God, to be in communion with the divine life, to be in community through a covenant relationship with God. Okay, let's see. Uh, C, we're now not on C. The word is death. Yeah, the word is death. D-E-A-T-H, that kind of death. Separation and alienation. <clears throat> Um, okay, D, life. Well, I want to comment a little yeah, on this. Yeah, that yeah. Um, in the Hebrew psyche, in the Jewish mentality, death is seen in relational terms. So the most striking feature of death to a Jewish person is the loss of a relationship that no longer that person is no longer there whereas to the greeks death was more about the destruction of the body but the emphasis is different with the jews it's not so much the destruction of the body as it is about the loss of relationship so death was understood in relational terms it was the same as alienation. This reminds me of a story. A friend of mine who was Jewish decided to become a Christian. And when he did, his family was scandalized and they had a funeral for him as if he had died and they refused to accept him and to talk to him or have any kind of relationship. His conversion away from Judaism into Christianity ended the relationship. It was as if he died. Isn't that sad? So death is relational. Separation and alienation are a better way to think of the word death. Well, and, and some denominations in Christianity um, have a, a similar um, idea. For example, the Amish. Yeah. Isn't it called shunning? Yeah, it's called shunning. Mm. And if a, a, a teenager is given one or two years to experience the secular world and freedom, mm. And um, with, with the hope that they'll come back into the community. Yeah. But if they opt to leave, um, the, from the point of view of the church community, they are dead to the community mm. by that point. It's, and I was, um, mm. and I'll tell a story. I was sitting minding my own business in a restaurant one evening and there were a group of young adult men sitting in the next booth there must have been like four mm. and three of them were telling the fourth that his behavior was such that they were shunning him henceforth and that he would no longer be welcome in their group, I was, my ears were burning, you know, listening to all of that. I didn't intervene in any way, but it was clearly that was the, um, the theme that they were engaged in that night at, in that place. So you can find it if you hunt for it, you can find that notion that separation and alienation is some sort of a death of relationship. Yeah. It's understood in relational terms. In, in relational terms. D, um, the word is life. Life. Referring to the divine life or spiritual life. And there's a particular Greek word for that called zoe. 
Uh, remember the woman's name, Zoe? That's how it's spelled. Z-O-E, Zoe, which means spiritual life which is different from the other Greek word for life, which is called bios or bios, where we get the word biology from. That is about physical, organic life. But Zoe is about divine or spiritual life. E. <clears throat> the word is reconciliation. An aspect of salvation that refers to the restoration of humanity from death to life. Having been dead to God, we are now through Christ made alive to God, is the quote. It reminds me of the parable of the prodigal son. When the prodigal returns to the arms of his loving father, the father goes to his elder brother to, walk, to have him come to the party to welcome his younger brother who had gone away. And um, the older brother refused to go. And the father says something like, come celebrate with me and share the joy because your brother who was dead is now made alive. It was relational. He never was literally dead, but he was dead to his father. And his return and reconciliation was to come back to relationship with his father. So reconciliation is life. And um, oftentimes Christians talk about having a ministry of reconciliation. Yes. Okay, F, the word is sin. The literal meaning of the word sin is to miss the mark. And um, the imagery from which this term comes is shooting an arrow at a target and missing the target. So something veers off course, the arrow yeah. uh -huh. veered off course a dy dynamic principle at work within the human heart that dominates and enslaves the human will and leads to idolatry and the vices. Mm -hmm. That's from Romans chapter one. Yeah, if you want to be depressed, read Romans chapter one. It will depress you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an implication though, because to miss the mark, there's an implication that you're trying to hit right. the mark. Yes, there is. And usually when we commit a bad act, it's usually in the service of a greater good. Mm -hmm. You know. So, or what we think is the greater or good. Or what we think is the greater good. So there's some awareness right. involved. Yeah, trying to achieve something you and think is good. It's not just thoughtlessness right it's more than it's right. different than thoughtlessness right okay. there's deliberation right okay we so, should sometime do a class on moral theology yeah. which is addresses all these things yeah because it would have practical application to us mm -hmm. as we process making moral decisions which we do constantly every day it's why I don't run people over in my, uh, you know, when I'm in the car because I'm making a decision that that's not a good idea to do that. Yeah. So there is a little bit of deliberation there. Yeah. Well, I tie the word sin to the word repentance. Um, people talk about you've got to repent. Mm -hmm of your sins as though what we're interested in is coming up with a list which right. i just think is a bogus understanding of what's going mm -hmm. on um the word repentance in greek my yeah. favorite word yeah, <laughs> is the word metanoia and it means 
uh, to turn around, mm -hmm. to, to change their way of thinking and to turn around. Mm -hmm. And that's what um, John the Baptist, I think, was trying to get all of his followers to do is be baptized, turn around, head in a new direction, mm. you know, and like change your mind, like change your mind. Mm. Well, the, the idea of confessing your sins mm -hmm. seems to have such a different connotation because yeah. it's like you had done something wrong mm -hmm. rather than you were making an effort and you right. veered off course. Yeah, that, I see what you're saying. Um, it's like commending the person for trying, but you just missed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it, 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 it speaks to motivation. Mm -hmm. Okay, G, righteousness yep. is the word, the state of being in right relationship or harmony with God, others, and the whole of creation. It is characterized by the word agape, or agape, yeah. which means love. Righteousness. Page two. Mm -hmm. Are we moving right along? We're on page two, yes. H, redemption. Uh, two um, is the word. H is the word redemption. To buy back, to pay a ransom, a slave buying his freedom from slavery. It is an aspect of our salvation that refers to our deliverance from the slavery of sin in order to become servants of love. Well, and that raises the issue of, are we actively engaging in sinful activity? Mm. And um, does that all have to be changed so that we can become servants of love? Mm. Isn't that what's happening? It's a process, right? Yeah, if you buy into that analogy. Yeah, I like the idea of thinking of salvation as a process. We are moving from one place to another. I feel like we're getting better at what we do in the things that really matter. I would use the word transformation. Oh, I like that. That there's a that we are on a journey of transformation. Yeah. I, I prefer that to a journey of redemption. Uh, yeah, redemption, I think, harkens back to the whole Exodus experience. Yeah. And the ransom theory. Yeah. And all that stuff. Um, yeah, that might that might have a Jewish background. I don't know where the ransom theory came from. That's the earliest one. Yeah. But redemption was also very early. I think if we look in Paul, we can find that ransom theory. I'll bet you. Uh, yeah. More, maybe even more so than Jesus, you know, so we'll, we'll hunt. Yeah. <laughs> hunt for the sources of the ransom theory. Okay. Are we done with that one? Yeah. Then I. I is the word wrath. Wrath. The Greek word is orge. Yeah. Um, wrath. Which is defined here as God's opposition to sin. Well, that may be true, but it may be more than that. Hi, Polly. Hi, Polly. We missed you. Well, here's our star student coming in the class Thanks. just as we're concluding. <laughs> we have to keep talking for another 30 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we're talking about wrath. We're on the second page. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what a topic to come in on. <laughs> <coughs> Well, it's is it page two, Ron? Yep, yeah. and the next one is J. 
<coughs> I is wrath and J is peace. Peace like P E A C E. Peace like in calmness or lack of conflict. To be absolved and forgiven. Um, well, the whole issue of wrath is like a giant. Yeah. Issue. And yeah, what does Paul mean when he uses this, this language? And what's the best way for us to understand it uh, today? Right. These are important so, questions. Yeah. Well, you know what surprises me? That what we say in all, in all services, peace be with you and also with you. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole idea of to be forgiven, to right. be absolved or forgiven. Right. That gives a whole different meaning to peace. Right. It's not just, you know, be calm, be right. serene. Right. It's be, it's, there's an action involved. Right. There's a reconciliation. There's a reconciliation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, there's another uh, dynamic to this, and that is the terminology that is has been pretty standard is um, peace be with you on the part of the person who's mm -hmm. giving the blessing. Yeah. And of late, what I'm hearing a lot from those in charge of the liturgy or bestowing the blessing is um, the Lord is with you or peace is with you. Getting rid of the, the to be. The to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm and I wonder to myself if that's if that's the way to go. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. But, but that is that's what I'm hearing more. Yeah, I'm hearing that too more. And and there's something about it that I find attractive, but I don't know. Well, it's very positive. Peace it's, is with, with you. you. Peace is with you. Yeah. You know? And you also know. with you, and it makes sense, the dialogue. Peace be with you sounds a bit conditional. Uh, well, one time we like you're you. like you're um we're not toward you, like we're whatever. not at peace, and so be at peace. So there's yeah. an inference that you're not at peace. You're not quite there. Whereas peace yeah. is with you. Is. That's what now, I like um, about affirmations is it actually suggests before the something is the, lacking. Something's what, lacking before you what, give. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the 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 <laughs> analogy that just came to me is if you say if you've got a cup of water, cup of something, some liquid, and you say peace is with you i mean it's it's already there and it's spilled if you say peace be with you it's like you the person saying it is has, has to pour the the drink into the cup for that person mm -hmm. and yeah. when you're saying peace is with, with you, you it's just a reminder I, you've already got it you've got it <laughs> yeah. just just yeah, just to remind you that peace is well with it's you. interesting that you know picked up on it right away that means Everybody's listening to every word. <laughs> so we should explain that some Sunday. Don't you think? Be good in the modeling. Yeah, because we're doing something that people obviously are, are paying attention to. Yeah. And they're, they're either thinking we oh, made a mistake or we don't know something. Yeah. Bishop, yeah. When, when Jesus sent out his apostles the first time, Remember what he said when they went on the road? If they opened the door and received them, the peace will be there. Yeah, you give them. If they would not receive, you have to peace, you'd have to take the peace with you. It comes back to you. So yeah. the peace is given to you by Christ. Yeah. I'm glad you know that God verse in John 14 where he says that my peace I give you, my peace stays with you. Yeah, that's right. So that's probably the original intent of the peace be with you. And the joy, you know, it's also something important. The right. joy is given to you. So don't let take your joy and peace from you. It's a given by God. So maybe this practice hasn't been thought through carefully enough. 
Oh, we're thinking it through now. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Well, we it, need to. So it, it no. makes me wonder if part of it is a problem in translation. Yeah, that's what from, I'm wondering. From the Latin. What does the Latin look the like? Latin what does the English? Uh, what does the Greek look at? And what does the Greek look like? Yeah, we yeah. can do. We can do that. Let's look at it. Yeah. Do you have a copy of the Latin? I don't think I do. No. I think I do. Good. So we can look it up and play with it. Yeah. That'll be fun. So we will look into these matters more <laughs> carefully. Because this is an important conversation. I do love a good semantic. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is semantics, you know, and it is because we notice it. We notice the shift or the change. Yeah. Or whatever. It, um, and it can be kind of just, it, it can be shocking to the community. Well, I, you change a word and everyone's kind of like, what? Yeah, I think as Mother Diane said, I, I noticed that all of a sudden somebody was saying pieces with you and I thought, did you see that right? I didn't read about that. Before. Yeah, where'd that come from? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Where did that come from? But you know, I just yeah. got to go with the flow. Right. <laughs> Well, that, that's what most people do, but um, a priest has to be very careful. We're, we're expected to so, yes. we, we're expected to keep the tradition going, yeah. and not to play with it. You know, we can do some creative things to make the mass more meaningful, but we can't go around changing everything. Not when we knew we knew. Yeah, uh, we had a new priest here several years ago in two thousand two. I think it was before you started coming. And it was a woman priest. Her name was Mother Giovanna. Oh, she was just so sharp and skilled. I really admired her. She graduated from Yale with a Master of Divinity from Yale. So she was highly educated. Well, when she was ordained a priest, she thought it gave her license to do whatever she wanted with the liturgy. And she started making changes and the congregation members noticed and they didn't like it they pushed back on her and i felt bad for her but well, she, I you can't do you can't be changing no, everything I, not without a darn good reason right and explain it to people don't just yeah. go and make yeah. a change and not say anything right exactly yeah now we here in our community um we used to have the sign of peace after the our father like they do in the roman catholic church but we deliberately moved that to, to uh, right before the offertory. But we used our rationale wasn't that we just wanted to move it, just to move it. But our rationale was, well, there was a conversation in the Roman Catholic Church if the Son of Peace should be at the offertory or after the Our Father. And they decided to put it after the Our Father following the Council of Trent earlier. Yeah. It was a compromise, so they kept it where it was. But it, but the, all the liturgists at that time said it's better at the offertory. And I agree with them. So we, after talking about it here in the community, for many years, eventually we made the change, but we were all ready for it. Now, at St. Matthew's, we expect the sign of peace after the homily, before the offertory. Not me. Everything comes at me like a total surprise. Everything? <laughs> Pretty nearly. Ah, I mean, here I am, so many years later, still getting the hang of it. Yeah, and we try to do it exactly the same every week, so it will be confusing. Yes, yeah. I, well, it, you know, it's like the inquiry class for the fourth time. Yeah, well, the first, start, I start picking up on things. The first half of Mass is like a preparation before the Eucharist. I think it's beginning to dawn on me. <laughs> I, I'm the offertory you're giving to God, and then yes. God gives back to you. I love that, Janet. Yeah. Yeah, that beautiful. I never, uh, I don't, it's not the way my mind works. Mm. You know, unless you point out something that <clears throat> we, Perfectly obvious. So it makes sense to, to me that passing the peace is about the community and preparing for the Eucharist yeah. and then um, the prayer, the Our Father prayer. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, where does Our Father come in? That comes in after, after the Eucharistic after. prayer. 
after the right before the wine, so that's right before concrete. you receive so that's them. that's like a conclusion that yeah it is comes right before you receive the <laughs> that's too. and and what makes it eucharistic is the line give us this day our daily bread yeah oh uh, well, that's so perfect isn't it? yeah <clears throat> and the passing of the peace is the time in the service where the idea behind it is to be reconciled with everyone in the community and yeah. before you move forward to receive communion yeah. that's that's the game plan and the peace be with you everybody is at peace right, right. we're all ready right right it's making and it we made each other ready well also when we say peace be with you um and we're quoting the resurrected Christ. His first words to his disciples was, peace be with you. Mm -hmm. Which was probably in Aramaic, simply shalom. Uh -huh. You know? Which makes you wonder how and what the reasoning is behind it being changed. Beer is. Beer is. Um, is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Shall we move on? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Next one. Okay. That was deep. <laughs> uh, K is propitiation. Oh, that's a technical word. P R O P I T I A T I O N. Propitiation. Propitiation. The aspect of salvation in which a sacrifice, a gift of great value, brings satisfaction, restitution to the divine wrath. <laughs> The offended party in return bears the cost of the offense. Well, what? bears Wait. the cost of the offense. The offended party in return. Yeah, it's, that's, that's what a propitiation yeah. does. In agreement, the offended party in return bears the cost of the offense. In other words, it removes the idea of revenge. Yeah, you have to think about that. Yeah. The, it, I know this is a lot of this is hard to see apart from uh, Roman legal prudence. Yeah, and whether or not that notion actually helps us to understand yeah. the nature of salvation, it seems to me is an open question. <laughs> well, it is. And these are just all these are uh, are analogies that capture maybe one aspect. I, that's why when I wrote this, I deliberately used the aspect. It's not it, a propitiation doesn't. The problem I have with like the satisfaction theory is that it takes one of these analogies. It makes it the whole thing. Somehow all these things combined play this off. It's one of the words on this yeah. uh, on your chart, and yeah. I'm trying to wrap my head around it, and yeah, I'm wondering if it has anything to do. We, didn't we talk about sacrifice? We and we talk about that at the mass. We refer to it as a sacrifice. Okay. I don't have my one with that. I took all the notes, but yeah. maybe I wrote notes about sacrifice. Yeah. Okay. Well, where I'm having trouble with this is it seems to me that what's going on in the liturgy is, well, first of all, I think we have to remember that the word sacrifice really means a gift. Yeah, it's a gift. That we're giving a gift to God. Right, it's not a and, death. And the, the gift that we're giving it in the Eucharist is we're giving, basically, we're giving the bread and the wine. Right. Uh, we the, offer the bread and we wine. We offer the bread and the wine. And then it's returned to and us. And then it's returned to us. In, um, after transformation. And our and offering is a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. when you get it's, a offer, gift. It's, it's a gift. It's a gift. Yeah. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. yeah. Meaning that it's the same. And that's a sacrifice. Yeah. yeah a it's gift part is of a sacrifice. it. So when we offer our money, we're doing it at the same time we're offering the bread and the wine. And, and, yeah. it's, and it's in, one of the things that was um, revelatory to me in my process towards becoming ordained was the significance of the use of hands mm -hmm. in the liturgy. And one of the things that the, the blessing, the priest comes and gives a blessing to the bread and to the wine. Right. Uh, blessed are you, Lord of 
creation, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, that part. Yeah. Um, because it's through through human hands that we have this bread to offer, work of human hands. Yeah, that uh, prayer. And right. that prayer. Right. And the same thing with the wine. Um, through the vine, through work of human, human hands. hands. Yeah. And so, uh, and so that ordinary human activity, which is transformative because the grain becomes the bread and the grapes become the wine. Yeah, we, tr we transform. Yeah, we transform the, the products of the earth into the bread and the wine, and that's done with human hands. Yeah. And we offer that to God. And then because the priest's hands have been consecrated and participate in the action of Christ, then God gives us back the transformed bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the significant, I can't get over the fact that there's a really a strong mm -hmm. signification in the use of yeah. hands on the part of the priest. So it's not just the word spoken, right. it's the activity, the actions, the, actions, the gestures, the gestures that are part of the consecration of the, of the bread and wine. Yeah, nothing is accidental or incidental. Everything has intentionality behind it. All the gestures and the words that show up in the mass have been thought through for centuries. Well, and an offering is like the product of your work, right. whatever your work is. It represents your life energy in the world. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving right along then. Mm -hmm. um, law is the next word. Yeah, L, law. How'd that work? Count. <laughs> and uh, that refers to the Torah, uh, to the Mosaic instruction, and uh, to the covenant that's made on Mount Sinai. Okay. Yeah. M, liberation. Liberation. To free from the oppression the tyranny of suffering and death. Um, and back to Paul in Romans 5, where he says death reigns. Okay, for liberation, mm -hmm. that's not a problem, I don't think. N is grace. Um, the saving divine presence in the world the spirit of God in relation to humanity, the divine love poured out upon humanity and the whole of creation, the loving goodwill of God. And I have a story. No, uh, tell us. <laughs> when I was um, up in Oregon um, at Cowcross Farm, which was a which was a farm, mm -hmm. and I was doing pastoral ministry in the afternoons to a rural congregation, and my um, supervisor was an uh, Episcopal priest named John Thornton. I, I laughed at this for years and years and years, but one of his favorite sayings was that grace was like a leaky faucet that you just could never get to turn off. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and the more I've thought about it, the more I think that that's true, that sometimes you don't think grace is anywhere to be found, and sure enough, there it is. Drip, drip, drip. drip. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we there. certainly observed that unfold in your life. I'm still amazed by all that. And continues to happen. Yeah, it, it's still unfolding. Yeah. It's quite wonderful. Yeah, Sharon's the one who can speak to that yeah. the most, given that she was conscious and I was not. Yeah. <laughs> um, during about two years ago, a year and a half ago now. Okay, for Grace. Mm -hmm. Grace yeah, Grace. Grace. Now we're on O. Is sanctification. Is sanctification. The divine action by which one is made holy to be set apart for divine use and purpose, to be made God's possession and to be consecrated unto God. Um, I think it's very 
I, I don't think ordinary parishioners understand enough that the word holy means something that's been set aside for God. Right. Something that's holy is something that's been set aside for God. I think a lot of times Western Christians, both Catholic and Protestant, think of it in terms of rather than consecrated to God or set apart for God, they think of it as some kind of moral achievement or purity. No, that's, purity. Not, that's really not what it means. No, at not at all. To be sanctified is not to be made morally pure. Not that that doesn't happen, but it, it misses the point. Holy is to be made God's possession. Okay. Uh, Roman numeral three, then we're two. We're almost done. Um, life in the spirit. A, we no longer live in fear. The power of sin is broken. For the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Um, that's Roman 5.5. 5, yeah. And um, a very important line of scripture mm -hmm. is that um, perfect love casts out fear. Oh, wow. Does it have to be perfect love? What's the well, prayer? that's yes, John. That's yeah, from John. It's it's in the next point. Oh. The, you anticipate. I anticipate it. Because it's been a very cast out all in fear. Yeah. B says we now respond to the environment of death, not with fear which produces injustice, but with compassionate love, agape, which transforms our suffering to be a means of full redemption. Romans 5, 3 through 5. And then there's a quote um, from St. John. Yeah, the Perfect love, love casts out all fear. Wow. Thank you. Sure enough. This concludes our lesson tonight. We got through it all. Good for us. Good for you. You kept us going. Well, let us now pray together. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Be also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for the blessedness of being able to study the mysteries of our faith as revealed to us through the pages of sacred scripture and in the theological tradition of the church. May these truths that we learn tonight be something that inspires us May we ponder after them in the next several days and through them grow into a clear understanding of the salvation you have granted us through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Yeti. You're welcome. We'll see you when you come home. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Next. Bye. 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 Good night. Bye-bye.